Now in the next 60 minutes, we'll be looking at uh, the about four key areas. And um, we will also look at why this webinar is, is happening. But quickly, we will touch on uh, understanding the, the, diff the difference between graduate and management training programs. Uh, we would also look at um, the difficulty of graduate and management training, uh, sorry, the criticality of um, graduate and management training programs for organizations, then how to uh, design and execute your graduate and management training programs, and finally, uh, some key gaps that you have to be mindful of. Um, then we will try as much as possible as time permits to look at one or two case studies. Now, um, I would like for us to look at um, the why. So I'll start that with this um, quote from Jim Collins, where he said, if I were running a company today, I would have one priority above all others, to acquire as many of the best people as I could. Uh, that because the single biggest constraint on the success of my organization is the ability to get and to hang on uh, to enough of the right people. I think this is um, quite deep, all right? And from what we've learned about the business in achieving a lasting success, there are very few things, okay, that um, an organization can do that will make as much difference as hiring the right people. In fact, we can boldly say that the only one thing that can rival the importance of hiring right is to, uh, for a business, is to be having paying customers. So the major reasons why organizations opt for graduate and management training program is to be able to um, hire right. Now, some organizations use these terms um, in place of one another without really understanding the difference between the two of them. Okay, now, so let's first understand what graduate training and management training uh, programs are, the possible similarities and also the differences between them. Okay, um, but before we go into talking about that, we would like to have your opinion on what you think these programs are uh, in your own organization. What do you call graduate training programs or management training programs? How have you been using them? So please kindly put your thoughts in the chat box and uh, my colleagues come will be able to speak to that. Okay, so um, let's first understand what graduate training and management training programs uh, and also will also highlight what the differences are between both of them. And of course, would like you to put your opinions um, on what you consider as the likely differences. You can put them in the chat box, but we'll also share some insights with you based on our experience as to the difference between graduate trainee and management trainee uh, program. What are graduate trainee programs? Graduate trainee programs um, essentially are um, a, a selection of developmental programs designed to provide graduates with basic workplace skills. So sort of like functional skills, um, competencies that they require to enter into the workplace, you know, and ideally the duration uh, for these such programs is, is really not specific. It could range from between six months to two years. Um, but from my experience in, in graduate designing graduate trainee programs curriculum, um, what I typically tend to include is looking at foundational elements um, like business communication and writing, basic financial acumen, presentation skills. And we look at a bit of problem solving uh, skills which really serve as as the foundation to cultivate the right type of employee um, specifically i build the curriculum around four broad areas and looking at developing behavioral leadership functional and organizational value so those will be typical buckets i i, I would look look at so um on the other hand 
However, a management training program is um, exclusively designed for individuals who um, are aspiring to future managerial and leadership roles within an organization. So essentially, these set of individuals have some level of experience and they are selected based on the skills and the knowledge they already have. Um, and then they, they are developed in such a way that it differentiates them strategically because they will be leading and developing other teams within the organization. Now, if I was look at the curriculum for a management trainee program, I wouldn't look at the previous basics I, I have included in the graduate trainee. So in this case, because the assumption is that the cohort already has the basic and foundational skills. So rather we'll be looking at more strategic elements like design thinking and innovation, change management, customer value creation. We're looking at areas of financial management. And these um, areas are chosen specifically because the individuals being developed here are being primed to take, over, take on senior management roles and as such must have a more strategic focus. All these, however, depend and most of the time will depend on the context of the organization and you'll be taking into account the internal and external realities. Okay, so let me take it from um, the recruitment and assessment point of view. Now, graduate trainees are usually, okay, when we're looking at the selection criteria now, uh, they are first job holders, they are fresh from school, or at most, depending on the organization, maybe they have about two years work experience. So they are trained specifically to uh, take up certain roles in the organization uh, after completing their training. On the other hand, um, management trainee are usually people with some level of experience uh, in the organization, or they could also be from out of the organization. Uh, they are primed for uh, leadership roles or management roles in the organization. So normally you would have people with maybe about four or five years experience and also some uh, additional qualification, uh, MBA or some form of uh, master's program. So that's what organizations would normally consider when uh, they are trying to recruit for their management or graduate training program. Now, um, having established the difference between the two. Okay, so uh, the next thing is why, what benefit will an organization derive from even running a graduate or management training program? And I would like to start that uh, from looking at this um, saying from the management guru, Peter Drucker. He said that an institution that cannot produce uh, its own managers will die. I mean, I think that's a big word. Okay, so from an overall point of view, the ability of an institution to produce managers is more important than its ability to produce goods efficiently and cheaply. So how does this translate into uh, the importance of graduate training or management training program? Let me quickly run through uh, the benefits to an organization and why running a graduate training program is critical. Now, the first thing there is the ability of the organization to attract um, potential top talent. Now, organizations that run graduate training programs always position themselves as employers of choice. Now, the reason is because, I mean, research has also proven that, that potential millennials view graduate training and development program as the single most important factor uh, in deciding which company to apply. Uh, if, for them, it's more important for them to look at an organization running a graduate training program than just anyone that is calling for freshers. So because of that, the organizations have a stronger chance of attracting uh, potential top employers. Now, the second one is, you know, when a graduate training program is well executed, it enables the hiring managers to effectively and timely identify and separate top performance from uh, under performance. And this is going to save the company the cost of bearing the burden of unproductive employee. A good uh, benefit of running your graduate training program is the fact that, you know, it increases the productivity and effectiveness of your uh, organization. How? 
because graduate training programs tend to prepare people to eat the grant running immediately. So because of that, you are likely going to get value from your uh, graduate trainees. Then um, you are also, through your graduate training programs, you have the opportunity to identify and uh, develop individuals with strong leadership capabilities for your future management roles. And um, lastly, it's been proven that graduate training programs in comparison to direct recruitment help significantly to reduce staff uh, turnover rates. Uh, this is due largely to the strong relationship that I enjoyed within these groups, you know, when they are going through the, uh, the program. So they tend to stay longer in the organization than uh, people that are gotten through the normal recruitment. So uh, um, Sikomi will take us through uh, the benefits as it relates to management training programs. Okay. Thank you very much, Aki. So we'll look at um, the graduate training programs and the benefits um, for organizations. First, you look at um, organ organizations that run that invest in management training programs are effectively able to develop a healthy pipeline of competent and accultured leaders um, because those people have gained a wide and broad understanding of the different practices of the business. Um, and so they will in turn ensure uh, seamless business operations that lead to organizational growth. Um, secondly, um, what it, it also helps prevent a crisis of skills uh, shortage. So by, by upskilling managers and future leaders, it's an effective way for an organization to avoid a crisis of unfilled roles. Um, third, you see your in management training programs helps you identify early on um, competency gaps. So um, organizations have the opportunity to catch competency gaps in future managers or leaders very early and then they begin to develop those and bridge the gaps before they become uh, major issues. Um, number four is that it helps attract and retain the next generation of managers and leaders. And research has proven that um, millennial talent, for instance, have rated the fact that they can see transparent career paths or progressions. Um, they tend to remain extremely loyal to, to such an employer over a long time. Um, number five, there's increased employee engagement and satisfaction. Um, first, employee, uh, employees are confident um, when a management training program is run. The employees are confident that the organization cares about their professional development. Um, it fosters a lot of trust. It builds a sense of loyalty to the organization because they can see that the organization has invested in them and they're interested in their career progression. And lastly, it improves the chances for homegrown um, successors. So it, by building um, talent and building leaders and managers internally, you don't tend to have a, a vacuum, particularly when you're looking at a succession planning chain. You already have competent people to assume new roles. So those are some of the benefits of, of running a management training program. Okay, so if I take it from um, what Spomi just said, um, having established the importance of the management training program and also for the graduate training program. Now, the next question uh, that you want to ask is, how do you design and execute a successful graduate and management training program for your organization that can deliver, okay, on these um, benefits? Now, designing and executing these programs uh, require a significant different approach you know, because it combines uh, both talent selection and talent development initiatives, right? Now, um, how, you know, should your organization uh, design this program? So from our experience in uh, workforce, we normally employ uh, what we call a 5D framework right? Um, starting with diagnosis, which is where you identify the key challenges uh, the program will address and what successful outcome will look like when you're done. 
Then you go to the design uh, stage, which is your how you conceptualize and design the key components of the program with focus on the outcomes that you've identified in your diagnosis stage. Then the third stage is uh, to uh, effectively execute the three uh, critical phases in the delivery stage, which are the sourcing, the selection, and the development. Uh, before you now move to deployment, where you ensure that uh, your talent, you know, that you have gotten from your program are deployed in the relevant areas of the business with uh, clear KPIs and milestones and to ensure that, you know, uh, they uh, bring value to the business. So, and that will take us to the last thing, which is putting in place processes and procedures to drive learning transfer, uh, performance on the job, uh, employee uh, experience. Now, we will take this in details and uh, I'll let some um, psychomists speak to, to that, uh, starting with the diagnosis. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Aki. Now, um, like Aki mentioned, we're looking at the stages uh, of running any, each one, either one of these programs, and we adopt a 5D process. Like, like he mentioned. Um, this first stage is the diagnostic stage. And one thing that key consideration here is that when you're doing the diagnostic, it must be driven by some strategy. So essentially strategy must drive a process. Um, first, you want to identify what do we want to achieve today and in the future? So those are the considerations. One of the key considerations that you must have. Uh, once that is defined, secondly, you have to look at the roles. So what roles are critical to executing the business strategy? Uh, there has to be clear definition of roles. And once roles are defined, then you now move up to the next level by identifying the competencies that will be required to perform those jobs. So in the people who are going to assume those roles, what are the competencies that they need to have? Um, and lastly, you must be clear on what sort of talent must we attract into either the graduate training program or the management training program. That would be the ideal culture fit because you must be sure that those you're putting on any of these programs will naturally and seamlessly integrate into your organization and they align with the fabric and culture of your business. So in the diagnostic stage, there are certain considerations that you must have. Um, and then key to this is always beginning with the end in mind. So if you're looking at the end in mind, so if we look at this diagram, for instance, you see um, this workman walking on the pavement, they've driven their truck into that pavement, but have sort of like wedged themselves in. So clearly they didn't have a clear idea of what they wanted to do and already thinking of how they were going to get out of that pavement. So they've essentially wedged themselves in. So we must be clear on what we want to achieve be, and any of these programs right from the get go. Um, once that is clear, you now have to look at, okay, what's the outcome? What are the expected outcomes for the plan program? Um, secondly, you should be clear on the deliverables. So when we run this program, what difference is it going to make in our business? And, and lastly, you must define the success criteria. In delivering the program, how would you really know it is successful? So those measures must also be defined right from the beginning of the program. However, there are also um, potential tripwires or landmines that you must mind when um, developing either of the programs. So you must mind the gap of these areas. The first thing is when you're diagnosing for the program, either the graduate trainee or the management trainee program, you must be clear that and like we say in learning, prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. So without really diagnosing what the problem really is and defining an intervention, you have really, you're just, it's considered malpractice. So it's, it's really vital to con conduct extensive uh, diagnosis of the internal issues before designing um, to understand the context um, of the business. So, and then, as far as employee rule is concerned, the culture fit is really, really critical because 
you don't want to put people on the program that ideally would not be a fit. So they will just become a mismatch. And at the end of the day, it looks like the entire program was just um, a failure. It looks as you've just practically made a wrong hiring um, decision. So it's clear, it's important to do that. Um, in the second stage, we're looking at the second D, which is design. Um, in the design stage is where you look at the blueprint for the program. You must consider here a, quite a lot of things that must be taken into account here because like I said, it's the blueprint for the graduate training program or the management training program. So you need to be asking yourself a lot of questions in the design stage. You're looking at how many trainees are required in the organization because that will determine the number of people you put on the program. You must also look at the person specification. What kind of people are you looking out for? Um, then you go further to look at what's the learning curriculum that will be delivered and what's the kind of structure you plan to deploy during the program and but at the time you're even developing the, the individuals. So also you look at what are the processes you need to implement internally, where you have resources, and then which are the ones that you would outsource to get expertise from outside the organization. And then in terms of selection criteria, you have to also define and I, I mean, identify the non-negotiable selection criteria. So their base, competencies or base skills or base behaviors that you must have and, and others will be built up on during the course of development. And then what approach are you going to adopt to sourcing or attracting the, the candidates onto the program? Um, because it's really an HR owned program, but it's organization wide ownership. You have to know and determine what units in HR will be responsible for what and what, where are you getting external help from to drive to successfully drive the project? And lastly, the budget for delivery must be considered. So you have defined that right from the beginning. And so there are no waivers towards the end or during the program. So you're clear on how much you're spending on the program and have that signed off. Uh, Akinele, you want to unmute yourself, please? Oh, sorry. I didn't realize that. Okay, thanks. So now, um, in, in putting in mind uh, some of these considerations that Sukomi mentioned, uh, there are gaps that you need to uh, be mindful of. Now, um, the first one there is, you know, having done all that and all that, you must make sure that you plan uh, for more talent than you will need. Uh, because really, from experience, people would always leave. People would always pull out for one reason or the other. Then secondly, uh, from the start of the program, uh, even from the campaign, you must make sure that you design your retention strategy into your plans. Otherwise, again, there is no point doing a proper diagnosis going into the design stage, putting all those things in mind, and now uh, having people leave, you know, while the program is starting or when you have deployed them, right? So please, uh, let's bear that in mind if you are going to uh, really get value from a graduate or management training programs. Okay, so now next, let, let's consider how to deliver a successful graduate training or management training program. Um, the delivery stage, uh, which is the stage three, is really broken down into further three uh, phases. So within the deliver stage, we have the sourcing, the selection, and the development stage. So the first phase is where you actually source those who will be on either of the program. And I'll throw this question to Akidele. So Aki, what would you consider the best practices when sourcing for potential graduate trainees or management trainees? Okay, thanks for me. Now, um, from my experience, uh, HR practitioners usually struggle with finding the right pool of candidates uh, when sourcing for graduate or management training programs. 
uh, whether it is they are sourcing internally or externally for the management training program is still the, the same. So sometimes they battle with what will be the basis for selecting potential management trainees within the organization. Therefore, it, it will be helpful, all right, uh, for HR practitioners to bear in mind this question. So where can you source for the right candidates, okay? For your graduate training programs, where are the best sources, the institutions that uh, they come from, and even to the point of maybe establishing some form of partnership with them. And if it's for your management training programs too, okay, where do you want to find them from? Uh, we've had a case uh, with when we did the management training program for one of our clients in the financial service industry, where they wanted people not even from the banking sector. And there was a reason behind this. So you need to know what's the source of the right candidate, depending on your strategy for this. Now, what channels should you deploy to reach out to them? Okay, usually I tell people, if you're looking for freshers, LinkedIn is not the best place to get them. So don't spend your money, don't waste your money. And newspaper had too, is not the best place. So where are the places where you can get them from? Okay, you have to leverage, you know, I mean, you have to meet them where they are. Then what's your communication strategy? The other time we talked about building your retention into your design. So from the, onset, from the onset of this process, what are you telling them? What are those things that they see about your organization that will make your organization attractive to them and they want to join you? Then how are you going to manage their applications? Where do they submit their applications? Uh, there are likely questions that will be going on in their mind. Have you adequately addressed those questions? Can they see them? Or have you provided some uh, maybe feedback mechanism where if they have any questions they can call? Or you have all their questions already answered and put it somewhere where they can see. Then again, what is the time frame? Okay, and all the other application modalities, applying online, how are you going to uh, screen even when they apply online? For, for example, for us, uh, our application portal normally um, has embedded in it selection uh, process such that when your candidates are applying, you already know the ones that meet your selection criteria. And from there, you can take it to the next level. Now, having said this, there are also gaps, okay, that you should look out for, okay, at this stage of sourcing for your candidate. Now, we, these are not things that many of us will pay attention to, but the truth is you always have political candidates. Uh, these are people that are either sponsored by some external stakeholders or people that have high stake in your organization. Or it could also be, uh, even if it's a management training program that you're running internally, it could be some special candidate in a way because maybe an ED or someone at the top is sponsoring them. Okay, so you need to uh, be conscious of that and find a way of accommodating them in your process, but your process must be thorough enough to screen them out if they are not good enough. Then uh, consider equal opportunities, okay? Uh, make sure that there is a balance, either gender or some other biases that people may have in employment, okay? I mean, people say that they are equal opportunity employers, but let it not be just in, in writing, okay? Then other thing you need to consider are loose uh, criteria. So you don't have to be, uh, very, very strict, such that when you say you must eat this uh, point before you are shortlisted, and if someone is maybe one or two points below, I mean, there might be good values that that individual can add to your organization. So you can give room uh, for such uh, gaps, you know, in some cases, so that you have uh, a robust shortlist of um, candidates. Okay, now the next um, phase, okay, under deliver is select. And this is where HR practitioners should answer these following questions. One, what uh, are the shortlisting criteria? Okay, how are you able to tell the individual that can deliver on your uh, business strategy, the reason why you are 
uh, running the graduate or management training programs, what are the critical competencies that you are selecting for, uh, and how, what are the assessment methods that you are going to use to ensure that, you know, you are evaluating people based on those critical competencies, then how many stages of assessment interviews should or I mean, assessment or interviews should you be having? Uh, are you just going to run interview? Are you going to consider assessment center? All these things have to be considered. And who and who will be involved in your selection process? Okay, of course, there has to be a thoroughly uh, selected people that you will bring into your selection program. So because of that, there are also gaps, okay, uh, that you need to be conscious of. And this include, okay, one uh, is the brief clear to everybody that is going to be involved in the project. Okay, what's the purpose? Do they understand the scope? Is, is it well defined? Uh, so that people are not just running interview or doing assessment without knowing the end in mind. Okay, then again, is there a well defined success profile? Uh, can you tell you know that? This is your ideal person, and this is well understood by everybody that is involved in that project. Okay, what are the best sources of your top talents? Okay, is the application process well defined and you know uh, right elements incorporated into it? Uh, for your test, is it secured enough? And who are the people handling it? This is something that you know people uh, can compromise. Then, do you have the technology capabilities required, especially in this age where most things are done virtually? So, can you assess competently uh, using technology? And at the other end, the candidates, uh, would they be required to probably go and subscribe to a broadband internet before they can join your uh, process? So, these are the things that you need to consider. The quality of your instrument is it valid, reliable, and objective? Then the team, this is very, very important, okay? Especially when you have assessors, interviewers that will be involved. Do they know what they are going to be assessing for? Then people that will be relating with your candidate, are they professional enough? Are they courteous enough to be able to uh, present the right um, image? Then your reporting, you know, is it robust enough to be able to make you uh, give the next, I mean, make the, the, the right recommendations uh, when you are done with the program. So now the third phase uh, under deliver is the develop phase. Um, now, Sukomi, so being the subject matter expert in this area, what should anyone planning a graduate trainee or management training program focus on under this phase? Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Aki. You know, um, after approaching graduate training programs, I mean, from getting the right people into the room, um, it, it's important now to now define what happens in the room, you know, and that is really determining at that point the, how the candidates will be developed to attain the desired outcomes. So at this stage, what are you considering? You begin to look at what learning and development strategies you're going to utilize to develop the trainees. Um, you also must be clear on the competencies that the curriculum must prioritize. So we have certain competencies and then those competencies must be driven by the curriculum. But of course, based on the developmental requirements of each of the groups, you now have to be clear on which ones you prioritize during the program. And of course, you also determine what learning methodologies to adopt. Um, right now, we're in an environment where the younger generation of learners are, are people who like bite-sized learning, they like digital learning, they have possibly a shorter attention span. So you must design the programs, uh, deliver the programs in a way that you continue to retain and get their attention. And at the same time, ensure that learning is being transferred. So the learning methodologies there are very, very critical. So um, I think at this point, we'll just, you know, take a quick poll and we look at um, how our audience typically deliver that develop phase of either their graduate trainee or their management training program. So you will run a quick poll and ask, you know, how do they currently do it? What methodologies do they 
adopt. So the poll is up now. So it's either you use internal trainers, um, you use external trainers or consultants, or you adopt a blend of both. So we'll run the poll for about 30 seconds. some very interesting results here. Okay, we'll just do a countdown now. So we'll stop in the poll very shortly. Um, if you haven't cast your vote, please do so now. Okay, so we'll end the poll. Yep. Um, quite interesting results uh, we have there. I think half of the respondents uh, typically are looking at adopting a blend of both. That is using internal expertise and um, blending it with um, external trainers or consultants, which is an ideal approach to, to adopt uh, for the session. So that's brilliant. So we'll just move on. Um, to the next uh, stage. So we're looking at the in the deliver stage. Um, like I said, one of the things that I highlighted earlier was to look at which programs will be run in-house by internal faculty and which will be outsourced. And I'm happy to see that um, half the respondents are quite inclined to adopting a blend of, of both, which is the really a very fantastic and the best approach to, to adopt. However, as usual, there's certain considerations that you must be mindful of. So you must mind the gap for certain pitfalls that could potentially erode value from the program delivery. Um, first and foremost, you must ensure that when designing learning or when you're delivering the learning at first, it is delivered with an application focus. So that is ensuring that the delegates on the program are able to take the learning and apply immediately back in the workplace. Um, this you can achieve by ensuring that you use um, a blend of case studies or tasks and projects, which they will have to test themselves and apply the knowledge on. And you also have to determine the measures of evaluation. So how are you evaluating that learning taken from any one of these sessions is being applied on the job. So these kind of task projects, um, assignments are what really helps in, in, in achieving that. Because the really the aim of learning is to improve systems, processes and functions. And therefore it is very important for you to have a system, you know, how theoretical knowledge is translated into actual visible and measurable job impact. Um, and over time, um, we've realized that people expect knowledge to automatic, automatically translate into results. So they attend a training session and they expect that, oh, once they've gone through the session, they get back onto the job. It's just automatic. Now, it doesn't happen that way. There has to be a system that drives it. So HR teams can create processes and initiatives to aid learning transfer. So, and examples of, of this is by giving them stretch tasks you can give on the job projects. They, they can look at some uh, business problem and they look at that as a project that they now have to identify and find solutions for, which the learning they've taken from the class will be very useful in, in delivering this. And then you also have to evaluate periodically. So you have check-ins to see how well the learning is being transferred. Okay, uh, thanks, Mr. Komi. So we go to the next um, stage, which is stage four, and that's um, to deploy. So after sourcing and developing the new graduate training and management trainings, the next step is to deploy them into the organization, okay? Now, there are also considerations that you must uh, bear in mind uh, when doing that. So there must be a um, criteria for deploying the staff to different areas, which must have been identified uh, right before time, you know, because many times we realize that people just 
look at what they see in some cases to deploy people. Uh, for example, we've had instances where uh, a staff was deployed to a marketing function because she was uh, outspoken during the program. And that was taken to mean that she can sell, okay, and all that, but that's just a wrong way of deploying. So there must be clear criteria for deploying the staff, and there must be a way of trying to identify those criteria you know, before the time of deployment. Then uh, what's the plan for bridging the gap between pre and post deployment uh, experience, okay? Uh, there must be an avenue for frequent checking uh, to provide a way to uh, get feedback from the uh, the participants in the program and also find also a way of giving them feedback. So all these things must have been uh, structured into that state. Now, it is also essential to observe your new employees and mind the gaps in their attitudes and mindsets. Okay, there is this uh, delusion of grandeur where people I have this impression that they are smarter or they have some traits, okay, that make them better than, than others, which normally, you know, lead to this idea of they being, you know, more supreme uh, to other staff. We've seen that happen a lot, especially in management training programs, you know, because some set of people have been selected in the organization, they now feel that yes we are the ones you know that can do it that every other person you know is not adding value to the organization so you must be conscious of that then another thing is competitors and clients because most times they know that you have invested in these people and that's why you must have a retention strategy uh, when you are designing your program because they will come after your people uh because they understand that you have imputed uh, a lot of value into them, so they will just be waiting for you. So um, uh, let's see how we take the last stage, which is um, drive. Okay, thank you very much, um, Aki. Um, the final stage in the designing and executing successful graduate trainee or management trainee program is the drive stage. And um, in this stage, you're looking at strategies for applying and retaining the talent from the program and show so that, such that, you know, those new behaviors and skills that they've adopted, uh, um, internalized are continuously translated into work. So in this stage, what we're really looking at is how the learning is continuously applied. That's why we call it the drive. However, the considerations here, just like we've spoken about earlier for the uh, for the previous stages, is to really be clear on how you will drive transfer of learning from classroom back to work. So it's not enough for them to just attend the sessions. You have to be clear on how that learning is going to be transferred. And then you also identify the talent management practices that you will put in place to ensure that a, the pre-existing culture and climate within the organization just, just doesn't absorb them because these new group of people are meant to be like injecting fresh blood, fresh ideas into the organization. So let them not, you know, just be same of the same. Um, and thirdly, you would need to identify how you will help the trainees settle and integrate into the organization. So there are various ways by which you can do that. They must settle in easily. They must feel a sense, have a sense of belonging. And there are various ways by which you can do that. It's either you do some um, onboarding, very robust onboarding program. You let them have um, work buddies. So when they get into the workplace, they have a buddy that becomes their sort of like uh, integration companion that helps them really settle in. Um, However, as usual, you know, you, there are mind the gaps that you, you have to, you know, keep your sights on. Um, one thing that typically happens is the situation between HR and the rest of the organization where we look at it, we liken it to a boat capsizing. And the, there's now, you know, transferred uh, uh, responsibility or there's uh, a finger pointing as to who's really responsible. And just like we can see in this image, 
there's a capsized boat, the boat sinks. But the question is, okay, where did the leak in the boat come from? And we tend to find this situation a lot. So to avoid these, uh, such a situation, HR executives should typically mind the following gaps. Um, once you set out to run either of these programs, you must be clear where the finish line is. So at what point you're ending the program and what are you evaluating at that point? So you don't begin to shift the goalpost at that time. Um, you must also recognize that delivering a management training program or a graduate training program is a shared responsibility. So once HR tries to own it um, solely, if anything happens, then HR takes the blame. But there must be a lot of agreement across the organization. So there are several stakeholders that um, are involved in the program. They must be involved. Thirdly, we must be clear on the learning points. What learning are we desirous of taking out of the program? And this must be um, established. And so it shouldn't be vague or unclear. Uh, and lastly, there must be a system where we can do this on a continuous basis. So where the new people who are going to even come to running, there must be a system of button exchange where there is a repeated and continuous cycle of improvement and of, of delivery of the program. Okay, so um, let's cap it off. Um, I'm just going to speak to a case study to illustrate some of the things we've uh, discussed so far. Uh, it's uh, a management training program that we did for one of our clients. Now, uh, uh, Supermiss spoke about starting from the point of looking at your strategy the other time. So for this organization, what they were after was, okay, we have a bank, but we just want to move away from doing bank in the traditional way. So uh, they decided that, okay, they needed people at the middle management cadre that they can now develop to take on more leadership roles. So because of what they set out to do, this change in strategy, so one of the things they decided is we're not going to be getting people from uh, financial institutions at all, not from banks. Okay, they wanted people from uh, FMCG, telecoms, tech, and all that, uh, that are occupying certain roles. Then they also uh, added, uh, I mean, of course, the years of experience, four, between four and six years experience, uh, master's program. Uh, but one of the things that is specified is the master's must uh, uh, be one done abroad. Okay, so that informed the whole uh, stages that we follow because again, that imparted on how we help them source for candidates. We had to partner with uh, institutions abroad uh, to be able to have access to Nigerians uh, that studied in their institution. Uh, I mean, as far back as then, even before um, COVID made popular the use of virtual interview, it was also part of our process. Okay, so we're clear with um, how we're going to scrape it because many of them we are spread all over the world. So this really informed every step that we take. Of course, uh, part of what they did also was building their retention uh, strategy into the program such that for everyone that is coming through that program, there is a clear path based on your performance in this number of years, this is the grade you get into another. So this made it a lot more attractive and they were able to attract ta talent you know, from all over the world, even people coming back to Nigeria to come and take on the role. So this uh, further illustrates the importance of starting with the end in mind which was um, where we um, uh, started from.